Homily 18, from the Homilies on 1 Timothy by St. John Chrysostom, translated by Philip Schaeff. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1 Timothy 6, verses 13-16 through 16. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep his commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Again he calls God to witness, as he had done a little before, at once to increase his disciples' awe, and to secure his safety, and to show that these were not human commandments, that receiving the commandment as from the Lord himself, and ever bearing in mind the witness before whom he heard it, he may have it more fearfully impressed upon his mind. I charge thee, he says, before God, who quickeneth all things, hear at once consolation in the dangers which awaited him, and a remembrance of the resurrection awakened in him. And before Jesus Christ, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, the exhortation again is derived from the example of his master. And what he means is this, as he had done, so ought ye to do. For for this cause he witnessed that we might tread in his steps. A good confession. What does he mean in his epistle to the Hebrews? looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Yeast ye be worried and faint in your minds, that he now does to his disciple Timothy, as if he had said, Fear not death, since thou art the servant of God, who can give life to all things? But to what good confession does he allude? To that which he made when Pilate asked, Art thou a king? To this end, he said, was I born. And again, I came that I might bear witness to the truth. Behold, these have heard me. He may mean this, or that when asked, Art thou the Son of God? He answered, Thou sayest that I am the Son of God. And many other testimonies and confessions did he make. Verse 14, that thou keep this commandment without spots, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, until thy end, thy departure hence. Though he does not so express it, but that he may the more arouse him, says, till his appearing. But what is to keep the commandment without spot? To contradict no defilement, either of doctrine or of life. Verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. Of whom are these things said? Of the Father or the Son? Of the Son, undoubtedly. And it is said for the consolation of Timothy, that he may not fear nor stand in awe of the kings of the earth. In his times, that is, in the due and fitting times, that he may not be impatient, because it has not yet come, and whence is it manifest that he will show it? Because he is the potentate, the only potentate. He then will show it, who is blessed, nay, blessedness itself. And this is said to show that in that appearing there is nothing painful or uneasy. But he says only, either in contradiction to men, or because he was unoriginated, or, as we sometimes speak of a man, whom we wish to extol, who only hath immortality. What then? Hath not the Son immortality? Is he not immortality itself? How should not he, who is of the same substance with the Father, have immortality? Dwelling in light which no man can approach unto, is he then himself one light, and there is another in which he dwells? Is he then circumscribed by place? Think not of it, but this expression is represented the incomprehensibleness of the divine nature. Thus he speaks of God in the best way he is able. Observe how, when the tongue would utter something great, it fails in power. 
whom no man hath seen nor can see as indeed no one hath seen the son nor can see him to whom be honour and power everlasting amen thus properly and much to the purpose he has spoken of god for as he has called him to witness he speaks much of that witness that his disciple may be in greater awe in these terms he ascribes glory to him and this is all we can do or say we must not inquire too curiously who he is if power everlasting is his fear not yea though now it take not place to him is honour to him is power evermore verse seventeen charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded he has said well rich in this world for there are others rich in the future world and this advice he gives knowing that nothing so generally produces pride and arrogance as wealth to abate this therefore he immediately adds nor trust in uncertain riches since that was the source of pride inasmuch as he who hopes in god is not elated why dost thou place thy hopes upon that which is instantly transferable for such is wealth and why hopest thou on that which thou canst not be confident but you say how can they avoid being high-minded by considering the instability and uncertainty of riches that hope in god is infinitely more valuable god being the author of wealth itself verse seventeen but in the living god he says who giveth us richly all things to enjoy this all things richly is justly spoken in reference to the changes of the year to the air light water and other gifts for how richly and ungrudgingly are all these bestowed if thou seekest riches seek those that are stable and enduring and which are the fruit of good works he shows that this is his meaning by what follows verse eighteen that they do good he says that they be rich in good works ready to distribute willing to communicate the first phrase refers to wealth the second to charity for to be willing to communicate implies that they are sociable and kind verse nineteen laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come there nothing is uncertain for the foundation being firm there is no instability all is firm fixed immovable fast and enduring verse nineteen that they may lay hold he says on eternal life for the doing of good works can secure the enjoyment of eternal life verse twenty o timothy keep that which is committed to thy trust let it not suffer diminution it is not thy own thou art entrusted with the property of another do not lessen it verse twenty avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called well did he thus call it for where there is not faith there is not knowledge when anything springs from our reasonings it is not knowledge or perhaps he says this because some then assumed the name of gnostics as knowing more than others verse twenty one which some professing have erred from the faith you see how again he commands timothy not even to meet them avoiding oppositions there are therefore oppositions to which we ought not to vouch safe an answer because they turn men from faith and do not suffer one to be firmly established or fixed in it let us not then pursue this science but adhere to faith that unshakable rock for neither floods nor winds assailing will be able to harm us since we stand on the rock immovable thus even in this life if we choose him who is truly the foundation we stand and no harm assails us for what can hurt him who hath chosen the riches the honour the glory the pleasure of the life to come they are all firm in them there is no variableness all things here are subject to reverse and are for ever changing for what wouldst thou have glory the psalmist says his glory shall not descend after him and often it abides not with him whilst he lives but it is not so with virtue all things which pertain to her are permanent here he who obtains glory from his office upon another succeeding to his office becomes a private man and inglorious the rich man is reduced to poverty by the attack of robbers or the snares of the psychophants and knaves it is not so with christians the temperate man if he take heed to himself will not be robbed of his virtue he who rules himself cannot become a common man and a subject and that this rule is superior to any other will appear upon examination for if what advantage tell me is it to reign over nations of our fellow-men and to be the slaves of our own passions or what are we the worse for having no one under our rule if we are superior to the tyranny of the passions that indeed is freedom that is rule that is royalty and sovereignty 
the contrary is slavery though a man be invested with countless diadems for when a multitude of masters sway him from within the love of money the love of pleasure and anger and other passions what avails his diadem the tyranny of those passions is more severe when not even his crown has power to deliver him from their subjection as if one who had been a king should be reduced to slavery by barbarians and they wishing to show their power the more absolutely should not strip him of his purple robe and his diadem but oblige him to work in them and to perform all menial offices to draw water and to cook their food that his disgrace and their honor might be the more apparent so do our passions domineer over us more barbarously than any barbarians for he that despises them can despise the barbarians too but he that submits to them will suffer more severely than from barbarians the barbarian when his power prevails may afflict the body but these passions torture the soul and lacerate it all over when the barbarian has prevailed he delivers one to temporal death but these to which is to come so that he alone is the free man who has his freedom in himself and he who submits to these unreasonable passions is the slave no master however inhuman imposes such severe and inhuman commands they say to him in effect disgrace thy soul without end or object offend thy god be deaf to the claims of nature though it be thy father or thy mother be not ashamed to set thyself against them such are the commands of avarice sacrifice to me she says not calves but men the prophet indeed says sacrifice men for the calves have failed but avarice says sacrifice men though there are yet calves sacrifice those who have never injured thee yea slay them though they have been thy benefactors or again be at war and go about as the common enemy of all of nature herself and of god heap up gold not that thou mayest enjoy it but thou mayest keep it and work greater torture to thyself for it is not possible that the lover of money should be able to enjoy it since he fears lest his gold should be diminished lest his hoard should fail be watchful it says be suspicious of every one even domestics and friends have an eye to the goods of other men though you see the poor man perishing with hunger give him nothing but strip him if it be possible even to his skin break thine oaths lie swear be an accuser a false informer refuse not if it be necessary to rush into the fire to submit to a thousand deaths to perish with hunger to struggle with disease does not avarice impose these laws be offensive and impudent shameless and bold villainous and wicked ungrateful unfeeling unfriendly faithless devoid of affection a parricide a beast rather than a man surpass the serpent in bitterness the wolf in rapacity exceed in brutality even the beast nay should it be necessary to proceed even to the malignity of the devil refuse not be a stranger to thy benefactor does not avarice say all this and is not listened to god on the contrary says be a friend to all be gentle beloved by all give offence causelessly to no one honour thy father and thy mother win an honourable reputation be not a man but an angel utter nothing immodest nothing false nor even think of it revile the poor bring not trouble on thyself by ravaging others be not bold nor insolent god says this but no one hearkens is not hell then justly threatened and the fire and the worm that dieth not how long are we thus to thrust ourselves down the precipice how long are we to wait upon thorns and pierce ourselves with nails and be grateful for it we subject ourselves to cruel tyrants and refuse the gentle master who imposes nothing grievous nor barbarous nor burdensome nor unprofitable but all such things are useful and valuable and beneficial let us then arouse ourselves and be self-collected and gather our forces let us love god as we ought that we may obtain the blessings promised to those that love him through the grace and mercy of our lord jesus christ with whom to the father etc end of homily eighteen end of the homilies on first timothy by st john chrysostom translated by philip schaeff